Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar on staying resilient with increasing cybersecurity threats. Today, we have two amazing speakers with us, Ken and Tanya. And before I hand over to them, probably hand over to Tanya, I would like to let all of you know that in the end, we have a live Q&A session of 15 minutes in which I would request all of you to participate and you can quickly turn on your webcams and ask your questions. Thank you. Tanya, over to you. Sure. Um, thank you. Thank you, Shivangi. And welcome, everyone, to today's webinar. Such are the times we live in that, you know, we have to do this over webinar. Uh, but it's a very topical topic that we are going to speak about, which is cybersecurity laws and data privacy laws. I am Tanya Pawaskar, former Deputy Global Compliance Counsel at LexisNexis. And uh, one of the issues as in-house compliance counsels that we are increasingly dealing with are cybersecurity threats and how much the law is also evolving. And then the threats are again becoming sophisticated. With that, let me introduce you uh, our subject matter expert, a very eminent lawyer in this area, uh, Ken Shia, who is the partner with Baker, McKenzie, Wong and Liao. He has been practicing for 30 years in the areas of IT, telecommunications, um, intellectual property, trade and commerce, and competition law matters. He is also regularly ranked as a leading ITC and competition lawyer by top legal directories such as Chambers and Asia Pacific Legal 500. Uh, so welcome, Ken. It's nice to have you here with me. Thank you very much. Um, it's great to see everybody, uh, virtually <laughs> at least. Um, so I think, um, as uh, Tanya said, uh, what we're going to cover today is obviously looking at cybersecurity, what the new trends and cases are, and then look, uh, obviously, like Tanya said, you know, as in-house counsel, what, what are the key compliance areas for you to look at and learning how to stay safe. Um, Obviously, we'll take into account Singapore cybersecurity strategy as, as part of that as well. Um, so, maybe as a quick introduction, um, uh, you know, we obviously in we all are working from home because of COVID. And uh, I remember at the start of Circuit Breaker, um, the head of the CSA, our cybersecurity agency, uh, actually made a few talks, including one on a global scale. Uh, to the OECD, uh, where he talked about um, how you know we are seeing more and more cybersecurity attacks because of COVID-19, and it's it's very simple. Um, you know, when we work in the office, um, you know, we rely on our IT to look after the firewalls <laughs> to make sure that you know all our endpoints are secure. But suddenly we're at home, um, and the that just increases service attacks, uh, service for attacks essentially. You know, we have, um, in some cases, leaky wi home Wi-Fi. Um, you know, we may be subject to people driving past and sniffing our packet data, uh, et cetera. And obviously, you know, at home, uh, we may also face more calls, uh, phishing attacks, uh, potentially, you know, where <laughs> anything to get a distraction <laughs> away from, you know, uh, our computer uh, is welcome. Um, and, and, you know, since we have no face to face with our colleagues, it's sometimes easy to get fooled as well. Um, um, I wanted to ask you there. So like for us, mm. right, uh, the in-house council thing, we thought mm. that because everyone is working from home, there will be mm. less investigative issues, less of those things. Um, yeah. So are you seeing an increasing number of cases coming to you as well during COVID-19 on such matters as cybersecurity? Yeah, um, I know we have one uh, new client who contacted us last week. Um, and essentially what they've been done is subject to a phishing attack. Um, so they have an agreement with a Singapore software developer. They owe them money obviously for the fees, et cetera. And one day they got called up and saying, Hello, we are the Singapore service provider. Um, you know, uh, we have a problems with our bank account because of COVID-19. Uh, can you please, you know, send the next installments of your fees to this new bank account and we'll give it to you. And then obviously, you know, the emails look like it's coming from the Singapore software company. And then they also told the Singapore software company, 
oh, we're having problems paying you. Uh, so they impersonated uh, the client saying, you know, because of COVID-19, um, we need more time to pay. So don't worry if we are late. Oh no. <laughs> and essentially, you know, that's the way they managed to trick, uh, obviously the client to, to sending money uh, to this bank account, which obviously was a fake, uh, a real account, but went, but, you know, obviously not the software companies and bank, real bank account. Uh, and because, you know, they assume, uh, you know, nobody chased them, it was all well, uh, the money went through and obviously disappeared. Uh, so that's a live example of, you know, uh, tech, you know, uh, it's like relying on COVID-19, uh, possible, right? You know, I've got problems with the bank account, I can't sign the money, can you please use it? So that is uh, <laughs> a, a very live example, literally live example of uh, where we've seen COVID-19 attacks already. Um, that said, you know, it's not uh, new. Uh, if you look at the CSA Singapore cyber landscape, uh, so they published a report every year in June and, and the report has come out already. Um, if you look at phishing, you know, uh, in 2019, they had 47,500 phishing URLs with a Singapore link uh, were, de were detected, you know. Um, so clearly it's something which is not new, but people are exploiting uh, more and more. Uh, again, like I said, you know, they, there's more people to attack, uh, you know, people not in the office, they can't walk around and check their accounts, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we, we'll see more and more um, ransomware attacks for sure. You know, people taking uh, uh, hold of your your computer even and, and using it as a botnet drone, uh, et cetera. And um, you know, it'll be interesting to see whether you know the cyber crime in Singapore uh, statistics go up. You know, it was twenty six point eight percent of all crime in in twenty nineteen. You know, this is robbery, whatever it is, and, and cyber crime is like a quarter of it already, which shows you where the crooks are. <laughs> you know, they're all online waiting for you. You know, either is going through cyber extortion, CMA, <laughs> of you know, cheating. I was just going to ask you if that's a Singapore phenomenon, um, Ken, the the Probably. proportion of cyber crime. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, obviously, Singapore's quite a safe place, but it shows you, you know. If it, even if you think it's safe, you know, it really, the, the crooks online waiting for you as well. And you just read the papers, you can see all that it happening to, you know, ordinary people in the street, but like I said, to corporates as well. Yes, yeah, so, so true. When we are increasingly connected, we just can't think of our country being the only sort of exposure. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and you know, if you, depends on what sector you're in. Obviously, you know, if you're LexisNexis subscriber, you're probably somewhere in the financial sector. <laughs> you know, that's your profile, I suppose. And you know, the, that example on, on the right uh, shows you, um, you know, example of a ransomware attack which actually hit a Singapore financial, uh, you know, uh, institution. Um, you know, it's not, you know. In, you know, it's not isolated. Uh, if you read the, you know, the report, you see uh, in this case, this was a virus which hit, you know, the U.S. companies, etc. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it's not a, a Singapore-specific thing, but it does happen. And obviously, you know, um, even if you think you're the victim, you know, of a ransomware, yes, it, yes, you know, um, you will probably suffer loss. But um, increasingly, the PDPC, which is our privacy regulator, has gone after people who've uh, suffered ransomware attacks and find them, not because they've lost the data, because you know, for ransomware, usually your load data is locked up uh, before allowing the attack to happen in the first place. Uh, so you know, as a victim, you can also be you know, uh, financially penalized. Has there been and if you go any... To the... Can Sorry, I was going to ask about the ransomware, if have there yeah. been any attacks where, you know, like you know the Ashley Madison sort of ones where data has been leaked, people have been embarrassed. Has that happened in Singapore as well? Um, and well, so um, yes, uh, there has been. Um, you know, if you think of um, one of the early cases we had, um, so they attacked a printer. You know, this guy attacked a printer in Singapore, okay. um, and obviously. The printer had been churning out bank accounts. 
uh, and he managed to get a memory dump of what had been printed. Um, and then he started to sell that on the black, you know, the dark web, essentially. And the police actually found him. <laughs> I don't know how they found him, but um, they, they got him. Um, and, you know, this is in the early days, uh, you know, um, and, and that's what people don't, re don't re realize is that it's not just your computers. It's anything mm -hmm. which has memory, you know, printers, uh, et cetera, um, you know, can get attacked. And those are the stuff where, you know, um, often you'll find compromising details being released. You know, mm -hmm. obviously we've heard uh, the big Panama Papers thing, which was, you know, obviously um, a form of investigative journalism, but the source of it was, you know, somebody hacked into a law firm's computer system. Yeah. And got the data out. Um, and obviously that was highly embarrassing to many electrically connected people. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah so like i said on, on this one you know the csa has definitely um, tried to warn us all about cybersecurity, COVID 19 but you know it's not just us but it also has effects on the larger economy uh government and society as well um you know so we have you know just like like fire safety laws the reason why we have cyber crime laws is not only to go after the criminals, but to make sure that um, just like, you know, we the building codes requires to have firewalls, fire extinguishers and stuff like that. Uh, you need it safe for cyber as well because fire spread. And in this case, you know, your computer, uh, what is done to your computer can impact other people uh, for sure. Um, so those are the things which you need to think about uh, clearly. Um, and um, this next slide also from the CSA's website, you know, looks further ahead, um, you know, beyond COVID-19. And if you think of, you know, how the world is going, cloud, uh, yeah. AI, uh, 5G, <laughs> you know, those just increase the, you know, either, you know, the cloud in the sense that, uh, a lot of people putting all their data on that, you know, a good, nice, right target. Now, Touchwood, you know, yeah. all the big uh, cloud providers are fairly secure and you're probably more secure than, than you are. Uh, you know, your organization you can't spend as much as Google can or Alibaba can. Um, but, really, you know, the human error happens as well. Um, and uh, it's only as good as the access controls you put in place to protect your cloud. You know, so your passwords can get hacked as well. Uh, and exposing your your crown jewels. Um, similarly, you know uh, AI um, can get you know uh, it interfered with <laughs> and create things which are unintended. And obviously, 5G just means everything's connected, including your fridge, your car, your you know whatever it is. <laughs> Of course. So uh, we all speak about it, right? Where, for example, we have Alexa. And mm. Alexa is being controlled by even children nowadays. Um, and there was this big thing um, not so long ago, I think 2014, 2013, when people mm. were afraid, corporations were afraid to move to SaaS, okay, software as a service. Corporations were afraid to have that. Yeah. Um, and now we have, you know, server as a service, software as a service. Um, there yeah. are apps which just downloads it and for a internal compliance council to keep tag of who all has downloaded what software has put what data is it company data um yeah. it's just, it's just something we never imagined as a problem when we made those decisions to begin with correct correct yeah and and you know big data is you know big <laughs> you know in terms of velocity uh volume and, and veracity as well you know it's all uh, there and you know, increasingly people have to use it as, you know, as part of their inputs in, at work. You know, there's a lot of legitimate users for big data, but that can also be abused just as easily. Uh, the final one on, on that, the long-term one is an interesting one. Um, you know, with quantum computing, you know, Google's qubits and all that stuff. Um, you know, even uh, the basis for all our protection now, which is, you know, encryption uh, can be attacked and compromise as well you know takes the whole reason why you know we, we use all these strong encryption now is takes takes years and years years to you know even the, the supercomputer to crack 
Um, but with quantum computing, maybe that might take a few minutes. Um, you know, so that could really affect the the whole industry and and how we protect our, our data as well. Sure. Um, Do you think regulation yeah. is catching kind of up with the technology? What is your view on um, that? Okay, so the um, I'll, I'll come to it on the next slide uh, after this this one. I thought you just break in and, and just bring it in it a bit more home. Uh, so mm. I'm a photographer, um, and obviously I use Canon. <laughs> and and um, you know, apart from um, you know, you worry. So so at a personal level, it's you know you have to worry as a company. Obviously, you you know you're reading all these news and people saying, oh you know. Oh, it's great that Canon decided to put something on on the web, uh, you know, to allow us to host our photos. You know, the camera can automatically load up there. What happens if you know things happen and all get lost and you know, it's put on some somebody's uh, uh, you know dark web? Um, and, and in this case, uh, you know, they, they weren't connected. Uh, you know, the uh, image dot Canon, as well as the ransomware they attacked. But if you look at the timing, you know, it's literally you, know, you had one two days on this August. Third, so you have another one on August the fifth, and as in-house counsel, you must think like, oh god, <laughs> what do I do? You know, how do I manage all this? You know, this is um, you know, uh, in, in the ransomware attack, uh, what they leaked at the start was the marketing materials, mm -hmm. uh, which you think, oh, it's not very innocuous, um, but you know, if you if you know the, the background of the R five, you know, a lot of people are saying, oh, so hadn't crippled the camera and all that stuff deliberately. Uh, overheating and all that stuff. Uh, suddenly you say, "Oh, you know what? Uh, what's my what's of that? You know, of my internal papers have, are, are going out into you know the world, uh, etc." Uh, so a lot of implications uh, you need to think about. You know, not only because you know you've got a new server which is being attacked, but you know your internal stuff uh, which you thought <laughs> you know, hope will be private, uh, which does have impact on your image, your marketing, uh, you know, all that stuff is also being released to the public through ransomware attacks. So you're coming back to you know, um, uh, you know I think people doing about things about it yes. Um, so unfortunately it's not common uh, it's not the same across the world. Um, but generally, you know laws are there to protect data. Are you putting safeguarding measures? Uh, if law recognizes things happen, um, and what's more important is how you recover and minimize the impact of such a breach to resilience, continuity, and recovery measures. Uh, being transparent, uh, which entails breach reporting of some sort, mm -hmm. um, and they can come, you know, either it's a general law or you know, the you know, industry sector laws, um, and um, you, you know, even in in the privacy legislation. So what's common about you know all data protection laws is that um, there is going to be a protection obligation in there uh, to protect data, um, you know, which in, which you are processing. Um, but there, like I said, there can also be laws, especially if you're a financial institution. Um, so in most countries, that's the most mature set of regulations. Um, telco follows next. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, there can be laws like you know, China's laws, which is not limited to personal information. Um, uh, increasingly, you know, they are trying to, you know, whether it's through cyber hygiene notices, etc., uh, trying to ensure that it is resilient. Uh, and infrastructure driven. Um, you know, obviously, human errors is a big thing, uh, but and but infrastructure does help minimize some of those those risks as well. Like I said, there's no uniform approach across these countries, um, and they and you know they said they can be specific. specific. So in Singapore, we have all these you know the Computer Misuse Act, which goes after the criminals, Cyber Security Act, which goes after uh, owners of critical information infrastructure. PDP, which goes after all organizations, you know, the Banking Act, other financial institution laws like Insurance Act, which goes after financial institutions. But even the Companies Act has got provisions which, uh, you know, uh, potentially put liability on directors sure. and officers. Um, uh, with these laws and regulations, right, in Singapore, what we are yeah. seeing um, in this region, for example, China had their CSL come out about two years ago, and there was a lot of clarification sought after it came out as well. Uh, and one of the requirements was if you had certain number of Chinese national citizen data on your servers, those servers in some cases were required to sit in mainland China. 
Um, so, so does Singapore ever look at doing something of that sort? What do you think? No, I mean, we are trying to be a data hub for Asia. So, you know, we, we are trying to stop all these data localization laws, actually. Um, you know, because they stop us hosting the data, essentially. Um, so obviously, we, we can't have the, you know, our cake and eat it and, and have data localization ourselves uh, if we're trying to convince other people not to put data localization in place. Um, but it is, uh, you know, uh, increasingly, uh, I wouldn't say a, a common trend, but uh, you know, people like China have done it. Uh, Vietnam followed China. Uh, mm -hmm. Indonesia has got some uh, data localization requirements. Even Malaysia has some, you know, depending on uh, the type of data. Uh, so we can't say that it's not uncommon. Uh, but hopefully, you know, um, uh, with things like ASEAN, uh, you know, the, the efforts to create a not so much as almost like a single market for data. Uh, you know, we just uh, come up with consultation and model contractual clauses. Um, we're hoping that you know through all these instruments that we will uh, free up some of this data from data localization law requirements. I I hope so too because I remember us having that you know whole. It's again a different topic, not exactly uh, cybersecurity, more data protection, but the whole EU US safe harbor uh, thing when it was there and we had those model clauses, all of that. Then the GDPR came into place um, yeah. and we had to again do a lot of rework. Um, yes. So there was and, and at that point. Correct. And now Privacy Shield has been uh, ruled to be legal <laughs> as well. Um, yes. So back to the drawing board for you know uh, all the EU and, and US transfers. Yeah. So yes, it, it is changing. Um, you know, sometimes people react, um, and uh, you know, but what is clear uh, from, you know, from this case is that it it is serious thing, uh, and you know we find people um, you know a million dollars in total uh, um, for breaching the protection obligation. Uh, obviously, in this case, this was the Sing Health case. Uh, which resulted in a you know committee of inquiry and all that stuff, but because the Cybersecurity Act wasn't enforced at that point in time, you know the PDPC took action uh, under the PDPA. But it clearly shows that you know it is something which um, you know, they're willing to use. Not against uh, like obviously the government is not part of the PDPA, uh, but it is some parts of the government are subject to the Cybersecurity Act, uh, and uh, you know the permanent secretaries are liable uh, essentially as the owner of the CI. Um, so it is going to be something, you know, quite serious. Sure. Um, but that it's not just, cap? yeah, sorry. So ask if that penalty was capped, the 750K, what's the total amount? Yeah, so the maximum fine is a million dollars currently. Uh, it will be increased to a million dollars, uh, sorry, 10% of Singapore annual turnover under the new act probably, uh, okay. which may come into force later this year. Okay, that's massive. Uh, yes, yes. Um, you know, obviously, it's, you know, four percent of uh, global turnover and the GDPR is probably more. <laughs> um, you know, most companies don't have that much turnover in Singapore, um, but still, it is considerable. Um, but I think the 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 well, what is important is that it's not just the big breaches. Uh, you know, it doesn't need to be Marriott. Doesn't need to be Sing Health. Um, you know, everybody uh, is in in line, um, and even you know the second example here, even a school's parent association was was found to, um, you know, uh, be a breach uh, for failing to uh, have reasonable measures in place to protect personal data. So yes, obviously, you know, um, they, uh, most protection obligations are you know subject to reasonableness test. Uh, you know, what is reasonable for a big company. It would be very different from a school parents association, you know, or a professional service company or a cruise company or, you know, heaven forbid, a bank, you know, which is obviously, you know, has got uh, the uh, resources to, to, to do it properly. Um, so far, the fines have been, um, you know, uh, except for the 750000 you know, probably less, you know, than $20,000 in most cases. But clearly, you know, uh, PDPC is trying to go after everybody. Um, you know, who's subject to complaint, um, 
And even if it's just one people, two people, uh, they've, they've uh, issued decisions, uh, even the small, small features. Uh, so I think it's something which you need to think about, you know, even as an SME, uh, even as a you know, medium-sized uh, organization, uh, you need to put in place all these places in particular, you know, looking at the protection obligation and, and putting in place your cybersecurity measures because uh, P2PC can go down. You know, the CSA may go after you if you are, like I said, a critical information infrastructure uh, owner, uh, but P2P can go after anybody, <laughs> including, you know, the, the data seller <laughs> in, in theory. Um, so uh, what is coming up, like I said, we probably have a bill coming up soon, um, which will provide for mandatory breach notification. I, you have to be transparent and if uh, it affects, um, you know, there's a serious risk to individuals, or it affects a significant number of individuals, then you have to notify uh, the PDPC as well as um, potentially the individuals affected. Um, there will be greater emphasis on not only accountability of organizations, but potentially individuals as well. Um, so currently, officers can also be held jointly and severally liable. Um, but you know, for the more um, rogue employees, for example, uh, the PDPC can go after these people now as well, not just. Um, you know, the, uh, the the people who, I mean, it's still primarily, I must say, it's still primarily aimed at organizations. Uh, but, you know, in certain cases, individuals can, can also uh, be held accountable. Um, and like I said, there will be enhanced financial penalties. So it's something which, uh, you know, you will have to, like I said, uh, that's part of your hygiene now. Uh, you have to do all these things and, and put in places measures to, you know, like said, detect all these breaches, notify somebody um, and, and be held responsible for it. So these are the things now, uh, obviously this is, you know, a slide um, which is uh, challenging for everybody <laughs> to, to build up, but, you know, looking at, um, you know, what cyber capabilities our organization needs to be able to manage uh, is actually very, very wide. Um, and it's not something where you can just leave to IT to sort out anymore. It's not something, you know, in the old days, like nobody knew what cyber was and it's just something you turn to your IT director if you had one. Uh, you probably turn to your IT manager and say, uh, okay, right? <laughs> that doesn't work anymore. Um, and, you know, whether it's from a crisis communication, uh, whether it's from investigations, uh, from in-house, you know, how do you run that investigations? You know, what do you do for disciplinary measures, uh, corporate uh, investor relations, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. There's just so many things um, you need to build up capabilities in in-house now. Some of these can be outsourced, but, um, you know, it has to, your know, plan must take account all these different aspects of it. Um, and, you know, you have to be able to at least understand, you know, what are the touch points. Um, yeah. um, and like I said, you know, for in-house counsel, like, oh, okay, sure. <laughs> you know, it's not only about, you know, corporate filings in Acre anymore. It's like, mm, okay, <laughs> you know, uh, even come under the company sec, you know, will my director get into trouble? Uh, you know, for, for breach of his duties as a as a as an officer of the company, uh, you know, and then you know things like uh, how to deal with like the disciplinary concerns, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I'm not sure, you know, Tanya, when you you know before you left uh, Lexus Nexus, you know, how many of these things did you as in-house counsel have to deal with? Of touch with that. <laughs> well, um, but at LexisNexis, of course, um, there was like GDPR happened during my time there, and that was a whole different project. But in terms of cybersecurity, in the beginning, there wasn't as much, right? There wasn't as much yeah. exposure. Uh, but yeah. very quickly, uh, because it was a global role, um, what happened was. Um, there was a separate team under IT called cybersecurity, and we saw suddenly more and more people joining that team. It was like a <laughs> tiny team, and uh, we always supported them hiring more. Um, yeah. What came to us usually was um, interpretation of the law, and that's mm. where um, 
it was a bit challenging, not because of the way the law was written, uh, but it was more challenging because the regulators themselves were doing it for the first time in a way. So for example, the whole CSL in China, it took a long time for like some guidance to come out on yeah. what exactly uh, was really meant by it. Then there's also, there was like about a year ago, something proposal in India of, you know, uh, yeah. updating some of these laws as well. And yes. uh, so, yeah. So yeah, we increasingly right. see every region having these sorts of same journeys, uh, where the regulator yeah. then comes and clarifies what they're saying. Correct. And uh, the Indian one is very interesting because it, under the new privacy bill, you know, they don't talk about data users like in Malaysia or organizations, you know, in, in uh, Singapore, which is kind of neutral. They talk about, you know, data in data fiduciaries. And as a lawyer, the minute you hear fiduciaries, like, ah, <laughs> what does that mean? You know, is it a higher standard I'm, I'm subject to, you know, <laughs> as, as you know, the, the, the term, legal term fiduciary has a lot of loaded uh, meanings including you know prevention of making a secret profit uh you know all those type of fiduciary type of trustee type of obligations no absolutely um it's a maze and it'll be good like you were saying before ken if there was like you know some way to designate a country as a hub in this region uh, it would be good for, i think for all of us to know that okay it's fine if our data are there they follow these standards okay yeah, yeah. I mean, increasingly, you know, there are standards. Um, you know, in the uh, cloud space, you know, we've got the multi-tier cloud computing security standards, uh, which is something you know IMD pushed out quite a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And there was a deliberate attempt to, you know, like I said, raise the standards and certify the uh, data center providers here. Uh, but not only providers, but also people who provided. Um, Microsoft Azure is, is, is certified as well, for example, Cloud 365, uh, et cetera. Um, you know, to make sure that people, one, uh, you know, the, the most important thing in many cases is due diligence. Um, and through these cybersecurity kind of standards, uh, it's actually somebody else has done the due diligence for you. You know, somebody else audited it, make sure that, you know, there are right measures in place. Um, because if you look, um, uh, the ASEAN you know, model contractual clauses is one thing. Uh, uh, it, it requires the sender of the data to have you know, done due diligence on, on the recipient. And it's something which is very difficult to show unless you can say, yes, you know, I've checked and he's got you know, whatever, uh, he's been certified under ISO uh, 27001 uh, to 2019, or he's got you know, MPCS uh, level three, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's a shorthand, and like I said, you know, um, uh, that will increasingly be a selling point as well. So the CSA in Singapore has also uh, recently, uh, well, it's about to launch, pilot launch of the uh, common criteria. Um, so what you can do is you can get your uh, devices uh, you can put on the market, uh, certified, you know, that they are um, secure, essentially. Oh, yeah. um, so increasingly from an IoT point of view, they're important. You know, to make sure that you know, stuff like baby monitors, <laughs> you know, which you think shouldn't be hacked, but are hacked quite regularly, um, you know, aren't, aren't uh, a, a big security hole, uh, you know, in our private lives as well as our organizational lives. Um, you know, most offices now, if you if you go into you know one of these new Cisco type of offices, yeah, you know, every room has got sensors. You sit in front of the screen they know who you are <laughs> and, and, and they all customize to you and you know it helps you know with the uh, flexible working you know you don't, you don't need to have your own desk you know the whole desk follows you essentially but the imagine the type of things looking at you all the time and if these are not secure uh then you know that creates you know oh that's very interesting new project you're working on oh that seems to be very um like it price sensitive <laughs> that's great thank you very much uh, and that's what and so unfortunately that's what the, the criminals are, are you know, concentrating on of course and and now like for example because of covid 19 at least in singapore uh there is a lot of employee data as well that we like collect if they're going into the office there are those um, thermal scanners right that mm. are scanning your body temperature um yeah 
So we, we are taking care of more things than we used to previously as a company. And then those yeah. uh, health related things getting hacked into is whole other, you know, matter to deal with. Yeah, correct. Because, you know, all these things, like I said, uh, a sensor, you know, you know, if you think of this cameras, thermal imaging cameras, you, you walk past. Yes, they are designed to, to you know, check your temperature, but they also look at your face as well. And, you know, all those facial images are, I think, which be valuable from an intelligence point of view. Imagine, you know, if you are looking at um, you know, who's going into, a, a, well, not maybe now, but when we go back to <laughs> post circuit breaker, you know, who's attending uh, a particular investment bank. It can be very interesting and that could be very price sensitive as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so it, there's uh, lots of ways the, the criminals are taking advantage of stuff. Um, you know, not just normal phishing. Um, there's a lot of intelligence out there which you can gather. Um, and if you think of, you know, uh, you know, out that Singapore guy who got, you know, uh, arrested in the US for spying for China, uh, you know, he was basically looking at the web um, and trying to find sources, but, you know, this, you know, with IoT and all that stuff that can go to a whole new level of, uh, you know, surveillance, essentially, if, you know, all these devices are not protected. And of course, of course, it's, um, it's one of those times, right? Like we are anyway being watched um, and all this technology is like a candy in, you know, a big candy store for us. So we also click I accept each time as users. Yeah. Um, yeah. And when these users are employees, of course, employers have to take more care. Uh, plus, there is the organization's confidential information. So it's a whole myriad of information that is on web uh, because everyone's on the web now. Yeah, correct. Yeah, I mean the the thing with you know uh, data being the new oil, um, you know, one obviously is valuable. Uh, uh, so it's a something which people want to steal. Uh, but two, it's something which is useful not only to you, because it doesn't you know, just fuel your own car, but fuels other people's cars as well. Um, and you know that that uh, analogy can be thought about as you know why you know uh, cyber is so important nowadays. You know, just like <laughs> you make sure nobody siphons off the fuel of your car. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, and and you know even the pipelines transporting oil are you know national you know, uh, critical infrastructure, right? Uh, same thing with with data as well. Um, and that's what data, you know, cyber goes after. It's a tough time for a country. But, um, to come you know, this not correct. Yeah, but that's yeah, so. You're, we're not alone. Obviously, you know, the government has realized that you know it's the uh, whole of uh, nation sort of uh, effort. Um, you know, so there are four pillars in, in our cybersecurity strategy. Um, you know, obviously the government will want to try to build a resilient infrastructure. And that is obviously, you know, um, since so much of it is in the private sector, uh, the government needs to partner with, with industry um, and through either the Cybersecurity Act or, you know, uh, funding or whatever it is, uh, pushing, um, you know, uh, the infrastructure infrastructure be more resilient. Um, second thing, you know, uh, Creating safer cyberspace is not just for government, uh, it's also not for businesses, but also individuals and the communities. Um, so the government has realized that it needs to work with the wider public. Um, that's why you know we have all these cybersecurity awareness type of things, uh, etc., to get people aware. Uh, and these talks help as well. You know, trying to create a safer cyberspace for us all. The third one is to develop a vibrant cybersecurity ecosystem. Um, you know, so we talked about, you know, uh, the rising demand for data analysts. You know, if you go to the, you know, the, the hot cost now is IT again. <laughs> and US, you know, law and medicine are still there. But my third one is in coming in strong. You need straight A's to get how to get into NUS IT and, in, you, know, um, uh, you know, the comp sites. Um, but, you know, increasingly, it's also the cybersecurity part of it. Um, and what they realize that we need to build the talent. That not only, not only means bringing in the people, uh, you know, organizations who come and you know, train and, and uh, develop your local people, um, but also you know having uh, you know places like um, you know all the 
institutes of higher learning, uh, training up people like that and creating uh, internships, etc., and, and apprenticeships, and, you know, all this uh, stuff. Then of finally, uh, see working uh, to strengthen international partnerships. Uh, you know, Singapore's just an island. Uh, we have, you know, it's, we want to be a hub, but it's not much point if, you know, all the things we're connected to are all <laughs> cyber threatened. Um, so, you know, Singapore has been working in the US uh, and to kind of uh, help uh, ASEAN uh, economies uh, to develop their own uh, capabilities as well. I'm sure. Um, I heard that the Singapore government had announced like um, a fund for innovation in cybersecurity not so long ago with one of the universities. Yeah. Yeah, correct. I mean, there's it's a there's lots of money flying around in cybersecurity, and and you know people like Thomasic have invested in it. It's a, of Thomasic Link companies invested in it. You know, buying up cybersecurity companies, uh, expertise, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, it is a, a obviously a, a important part um, to our whole eco ecosystem. Um, you know, we want to be a smart nation, um, and that means that our you know, we have to be a trusted hub uh, as one thing. Um, only innovative, but yet safe. Um, and, you know, obviously this cybersecurity is a big part of uh, our Smart Nation initiative. Of course, um, and Singapore as a country is known as being a safe country, where there's the rule of law, and now it just extends to the cloud as well, in a way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, the, um, you know, like all things, uh, you know, it's the hygiene part of it, you know, if, um, and that's something which, you know, Singapore's gotten right, you know, from our, even our old, you know, initial empty littering laws, you know, it's the small little things which matter, uh, you know, the big picture, yeah, the, the big critical parts need to be uh, strengthened, etc. But, you know, everybody plays a part in, in creating, you know, uh, national hygiene, essentially. Uh, and that's what a lot of it is about. No, absolutely. Um, I think, Ken, that's 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 good, and I believe as an in-house counsel, that does give me something to take back, something to uh, think about more, and not sleep so peacefully. But but yes, it does help still. Yeah, I think well, firstly is that you know one, you are not alone. Uh, except especially in Singapore, you know, there are a lot of resources you can use, um, uh, which are available already to increase your own uh, like I said, cyber hygiene. Um, and uh, hopefully, you know, with the, uh, with the ecosystem uh, expanding, uh, you know, there'll be more people to help you as well. Um, but, you know, in the end, um, you know, you have to be, you know, responsible for your organization's compliance with all these laws. Uh, like I said, the PDPA applies across the board, you know, uh, companies actually come after your directors. Uh, if you're luckily or unlucky to be a cyber, you know, critical information infrastructure owner, then, you know, you have additional responsibilities. Yeah. Um, uh, but, you know, the, but in the end, it's the right thing to do. Uh, you know, all these attacks, uh, you know, definitely have a direct financial impact, but a bigger impact on your company's reputation. Uh, you know, like I said, you know, it doesn't, help if you know you launch a new product and suddenly everybody realizes that wow this is you know, a really unsafe product um, and you know all your hard work can go down the drain very quickly. No, absolutely it's a competitive advantage as well if we excel in this area uh, it's definitely that for us. Yep. Yep. Um, so the main thing is you know see um, uh, I think one of our slides talked about is that it needs to be come from the top um, like I said, you're not alone, you, but you do have to uh, essentially <laughs> make sure that your, your management is leading the charge. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, uh, it's a, and, you know, one thing Singapore has said is that we want to see, uh, and, and they led by example, um, so the government said, you know, we would make sure that we would spend uh, a proportion of our IT budget on cybersecurity. Um, uh, it obviously will change every year, but, you know, on average, we'll spend about 8%. Um, and the encouraging organizations to make it a line item in their budget, you know, to make a conscious decision to spend money on cybersecurity. 
um, and making it, you know, exit, uh, making sure that the board, some, something which the board thinks about. Uh, you know, it's not like Australia yet, uh, where it's, it is a kind of a listing requirement, but uh, increasingly, you know, you see around the world, uh, the standard care has gone up. Uh, and that, you know, as a standard, you know, what is the right standard comes up uh, that also exposes people to negligence uh, claims generally as well. You know, yeah. or you know, breach of you know, basically failing to take reasonable care. Um, uh, that also now applies to cyber. Okay. Um, and of course, I think uh, maybe it's a good time now, Ken, uh, to let people ask questions. What do you think? Yep. Correct. We got about 15 minutes for questions. I think it's 343. Um, so is there any from the floor? Or anybody got any Q and A's from the, oh, I see some something blinking. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's see. Um, we have seen many ransomware attacks in 2020 in multiple sectors during this crisis time. Do you think attackers are always one step ahead of all our security uh, majors? What should be major changes in terms of cybersecurity for organizations to avoid this kind of repetitive security holes? And do you think legal tech vendors are smart enough to solve all cybersecurity risks to the corporate world? No. So, you know, it's, you, like I said, it's a shared uh, task. Yes, uh, vendors can provide you tools um, uh, to help uh, shore up your defenses and even spot um, you know, things which are happening. Uh, it gives you more information definitely about, you know, the, the attacks you're having, um, potential holes in your security. Uh, but often we see a lot of it is uh, people as well. And it's not something the vendors can fix. You know, you have to fix your own people. You have to train people. You know, even basic, you know, phishing hygiene, you know, how to recognize a phishing call, phishing email, um, you know, how to escalate it, um, you know, what to do if you see something which is not right. And I'll give you a simple example. Um, you know, a lot of people are using Google Forms for now, at the moment. And, uh, you know, there's a little setting in there which allows you to essentially show the, you know, all the responses to everybody who's participated in the survey, which is good for an organization. But if you don't leave that on, um, you know, Anybody who's participated in the survey can see everybody else's responses and, and some of it can be quite personal. Um, so it's things like that, you know, these simple things uh, which you learn from experience. Uh, and like I said, now the vendors provide you the tool. Yes, you can turn it on and off, but without the right training, uh, you know, people just make mistakes and expose it. A lot of the cases um, in Singapore are, you know, um, human error. Uh, you know, a lot of data breach cases are human error. So yes, uh, tools do help you to minimize uh, the potential you know, harm all these uh, human errors can make. Um, but in the end, it still needs to be a corporate culture and training um, and uh, you know, discipline, uh, which needs to spread out. So you know, what the major changes are obviously yes, you do need to. Uh, you know, have the right tools, spend the right money, um, but increasingly uh, it's having the right policies, making sure those policies are uh, disseminated to everybody and people are trained on, on understanding what you can do. I'm saying, like I said, um, you need to have capabilities from the top. Uh, you know, uh, the management has to really make this a priority for everybody as well. Um, so that was an interesting question. Um, thank you for asking that. Um, there are, Obviously, the lots of, of um, other things. Um, so one of the reasons why um, the cybersecurity acts there is not only to make sure that people are more resilient, uh, you know, having codes of practice for you to aim at, uh, but also it's information sharing. Uh, and the cybersecurity act uh, requires, you know, owners to um, this share uh, cybersecurity incidents and, and you know, potential uh, uh, cybersecurity um, attacks as well. Um, and with more information sharing, you know, obviously you know, people are not just doing it, you know, they may be a very individual phishing, 
quite often they use the same tool uh, to go after multiple organizations. Um, so the other thing uh, which uh, what CS is trying to do is is you know through cert you know, you know uh, sync cert and all that stuff uh, is to make sure that uh, people are more aware of all the the, the threats out there. Um, and obviously, you know, the more people are aware of it, the, the more eyes can help to fix it. So the vendors are part of that community and, and play an important role uh, in that. You know, through um, and and you know, obviously, with all these um, bug bounties and all that stuff, uh, you know, individual vendors can also uh, enlist the uh, help of of the uh, private sector uh, to look at you know their products. Um, so it's a, like I said, it's a collective effort. It's not just the vendors alone, which which which, you know, which, which will solve all the worries, and you can just outsource it. That would uh, be nice. No, <laughs> you can't. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh -huh. it's no longer you know something which one person can can deal with. If you just look at this uh, chart, you know the, uh, there's so much. Uh, Things which are more than IT, definitely more than IT. Uh, it's not just something you can leave to the boffins anymore. Uh, any other questions we've had? Oh, uh, hey, Ken. Thank you for answering these questions. I have a request from one of our attendees to, if you can address this question. So it hmm. says, do you think there is a need of multi-factor authentication for all devices and accounts if working remotely? Okay, uh, so multi-factor authentication uh, is something for, for, for those who you know don't know what it is, is you know, your iPhone is a great example. Uh, you know, uh, it's a, it's a device you have, that's one factor. Your face is the other factor when you unlock it, you know, using, uh, you know the uh, whatever facial recognition, or you having even a password. Uh, so what you know, a uh, single factor would be just a simple password, and which are very easy to crack because um, people don't use great passwords. So the more the factors there are, um, and it's if it's something you have which is unique to you, like your eye, your face, your thumbprint. Uh, in theory, it is uh, you know should be gives more assurance. Uh, doesn't mean that you can't have men in the middle attacks and all that stuff, but it it makes it harder uh, to have you know more than one factor. And for certain things, uh, especially you know financial financial institutions uh, have required by the MAS for many years to have two FA for certain things. Um, you know, if you think of when you log into your bank account, uh, if you just want to log in, um, uh, you can you know if maybe just a simple password. But if you want to do a transaction you need uh, you know your token or something else so often it is uh, a risk-based thing um, like even MES is not required uh, 2FA or MFA for more than a few things um, but what they have said is that uh, you know even internally um, administrators should definitely have uh, multi-factor or two-factor authentication at least uh, to uh, access the administrative passwords, um, and that's something that PDPs is going to look out for. Uh, if there's ever a breach, because often the, the problems is that you know some of these just have uh, very simple admin passwords, uh, which are left around, never changed for years, and all that stuff. Um, and that was one of the factors in missing health uh, attack. Um, you know, there were system passwords, and uh, I had even a better example. Um, one day, one of the clients said, "Oh yes, um, you know, we had a, an employee. Um, he was having his leaving lunch, and he told his, all his uh, people around there, I think you should just leave the company. You know, you guys are paying, getting paid peanuts. I know because I've I know all your salaries. Over the years, I've hacked the database and found out all your salaries, and I keep this big Excel spreadsheet of it. <laughs> um, and how he got it was." Uh, Exploiting a printer password system and main passwords, <laughs> which hadn't been changed for seven years. <laughs> um, you know, so it, if you can, then uh, it's obviously better to have multi-factor authentication, obviously changing your passwords. But at the very least, 
ma making sure that the administrator type password level uh, in the rights are definitely secured by 2FA. Um, obviously, sensitive transactions, if you're doing transactions, mobile banking, you know, internet share dealing or whatever it is, 2FA is important as well. Um, uh, and it's something, you know, obviously with more and more devices having 2FA built in, you know, the iPhone or whatever it is, uh, it's easier to deploy that. Um, but I think it's still going to be a risk-based uh, uh, thing. It, uh, thank you, Ken. I'm sure all of us have learned a lot today from this session. And yeah, going towards the end, Tanya, would you have anything to say on this last question, which Ken just addressed? I guess uh, Ken addressed it very well, but what I would say is um, in terms of cybersecurity, right, what would be ideal is that all these things were built in, um, like, you know, cybersecurity by design. That would be the best stage for an organization to go towards. Uh, for example, we have single sign on, right, as an organization. Mm -hmm because people don't want to remember passwords. People don't want to change passwords and call the service desk each time. That happens yeah. a lot. Um, so though, you know, this multi-factor authentication is great um, and we are used to doing it with our bank passwords and, you know, Facebook and all those things where our devices are connected. Uh, but the future is single sign-on. We are used to it. And if it's mm -hmm. all automated where, you know, there is cybersecurity by design and this happens in an automated, automatic way with less human intention and, you know, in yeah. like putting in numbers, like Ken was saying, human error, um, then maybe if there's a model like that, that we develop together, this ecosystem of, you know, in-house counsel, uh, you know, external law firms, the regulators, the tech vendors, and of course, people, right? We need people more than anyone who are impacted by it. Um, then maybe we can come up with something which hits this whole thing really well, is, is what I yeah. would comment about it. Yeah, correct. Um, you know, the security by design is, you know, just as important as privacy by design now. So that's the mm -hmm. you know, one of the big buzzwords mm -hmm. now. Um, and that's part of the common criteria. You know, when you build a product, you also build your security in mind, you know, all this sort of stuff. Um, it is, it, is, it is increasingly, um, you know, a baseline requirement, uh, or will become a baseline requirement, um, you know, going forward. And um, uh, and yes, you know, there could be the holy grail one day when everything's on lockdown. But, you know, in the end, uh, you can't ignore the human uh, element uh, and human ingenuity <laughs> to get around all these things. <laughs> so it, unfortunately, you still need to watch it <laughs> and uh, learn from it. Um, AI may help, you know, all that stuff. Um, but in the end, uh, you, know, you still need human in the loop somewhere for anything. So unfortunately, that's also going to be a weak point. Yeah, of course. Hmm. Great. Um, I think Tanya, I could uh, pretty much, and I think all of us pretty much could relate to what you were saying because all of us tend to forget passwords very easily and we don't want to call the help desk all the time. So yes. So thank you very much, Tanya and Ken. I really, really appreciate your time today for this session. And it was really knowledgeable and I'm sure all of us have learned a lot and we'll be able to understand this in a better way now. Thank you for your time. Sure, thank you. Thank you Great. so much. Thank you, bye-bye. Okay, thank you. Thanks, bye. Bye, bye.